All right, enough about our products. Much as I love our products, we build our products for one reason, it's for our customers. And we've got some of the most innovative and exciting companies as our customers, customers that are truly changing the world through software. And, and, and we're, we're pretty excited to have three particularly interesting customers come on up. Um, and we're gonna have a panel discussion on how their industries are changing through software and what they are doing to be the initiators of those change that actually creates value for their customers. So to host the panel, um, I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome Don Clark. Don Clark is one of the most experienced and well-respected journalists in technology. He's been doing this for quite some time at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I've had a pleasure to meet with him many times, and Don, I think you're gonna host a great panel. So Don, why don't you welcome up our panelists. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have to call these folks out. We're going to have next uh, Colleen Baruby, Vice President of Business Services from Adobe. And just avoiding the taxi strike, we have Greg Brockman, CTO of Stripe. Last but not least, Sam Parnell, CTO of Bleacher Report. Great to be here, and uh, I'm sorry about the, uh, the taxi issues you had, uh, and uh, we, we will talk a little bit now. So disruption, probably perhaps the most overused word uh, uh, currently in the Silicon Valley landscape, but we're gonna talk about it, and we are going to um, talk about it from a different, couple of different angles. I'm basically gonna let the panel go through and spend a couple minutes just describing their job a little bit and how they fit into uh, software development so Colleen, ladies first. Sure, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, um, I'm responsible for business services at Adobe. Um, I've been with Adobe since 2007. And at the time I joined the company, we were a box software company that had product development life cycles between 18 and 24 months. And I came to Adobe with um, a pretty long history of leading IT organizations, and I was hired to run what was a pretty traditional IT applications team, uh, responsible for front office, back office applications, and a small team we called our business warehouse. Um, over time, my role expanded to include a web, all of our web applications, the adobe.com platform, and I created and now run information management for Adobe. In 2011, Adobe made a pretty strategic decision to go all in with SaaS. We started with our creative products, Photoshop, Illustrator, the products known as Creative Suite, which really formed the foundation for what we now call the Creative Cloud. And the following year, we announced the Adobe Marketing Cloud, which uh, focused on the digital marketer and really was an assemblage of a series of acquisitions that we had done, most notably Omniture in 2007. Um, as you can imagine, uh, those announcements really presented a whole new set of business and operational challenges for a multi-billion dollar 30-year-old company and really called on me to shift my focus and to find a way for, to make our organization a SaaS enabler. Ultimately, to achieve our objectives um, required us to make some pretty meaningful changes in our architecture, in the amount of innovation we delivered, and in our mindset to move to services. And um, throughout the changes, my team has been pretty pivotal in delivering not only the technology, but the process and the mindset changes. And I'm, I'm proud to be responsible for running the systems that run Adobe. Great, thank you. Go ahead. All right, so, you know, I, so I'm the CTO at Stripe, and I've been there since we were four people. And I actually joined, uh, I, I was in school, I'd actually spent a lot of time doing a bunch of startups in school and transferred around between schools and realized ultimately that the thing that I'd been looking for was the right set of people to work with on a problem that was meaningful. And I think that as we built Stripe, that that's really what we've thought about is that you can change so much of, of all of the variables, all your technology stack and, and so many things, but fundamentally people is the, the most important thing and, and the, the, the constant and uh, so I think that internally our focus has always been hire great people and uh, people that work together really well. And uh, that I think that that's always been a large part of my focus and uh, in trying to make sure that we're building out sort of our technology in, in the right way with, with uh, the, the right side of people. 
So I've, I've done sort of everything that, that you could do. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've built a lot of our, our tech, so a lot of our server stack and that sort of thing. Uh, as time went on, at one point I found myself uh, managing the entire engineering team. And uh, that, you know, that I think that one of the funny things about a CTO role is that it's such an ill-defined slippery one. If you, if you want to know what it means to be a CEO, well, you can go and you can read Ben Horowitz, you can read Andy Grove, you can go and you can look at these, these prototypes that exist in society, uh, but when it comes to CTO, you can Google around and you'll probably just find like this one blog post by Warner Vogels. And uh, you know, the, the, I think it's one of those things that constantly changes as your company grows, and, and certainly my role has. And uh, I think that the, the main thing that I've concluded, though, is that the T is a total lie. It's not actually a technology role, it's a people role. And uh, that I think one of the biggest things that I focus on these days is really trying to empower other people to, uh, to make big changes and to, to get a lot of things done. Thanks, Greg. Maybe you can write that book about the role of the CTO and pass it <laughs> on. So uh, Sam, why don't you talk about your job a little bit? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm the CTO of Bleach Report. I'm responsible for all technology, product, and user experience of Bleach Report. And uh, Bleach Report's about seven years old. It's a sports news website. Um, I've been there since very early on in the stage of the company, and it's been a, a really interesting journey, particularly around kind of disrupting sports media. The company was founded with a, a different vision for how sports media worked, and over the course of seven years, has gone from being a, a little sports blog to now the second largest sports website in the US. Um, our mobile app is now actually number one most used mobile app um, by time spent um, in, in the US, and it's been a crazy journey across seven years to take on a, a very large number of, of big media companies uh, as a small little engine that could and, and carry on growing and growing to, to get to where we are now. Um, you know, mobile is a huge part of what we do now. Um, Lou obviously kind of has been announcing some new exciting products in that area, uh, but three years into a mobile app, um, really that's really transformed our, our own business and is really disrupting the way that we have operated and really has changed us to be a mobile first company and that's really where a lot of our focus is at this point in time as a product organization. Great, well thank you. Well, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go over uh, what, what these guys have said a little bit and dig just one level deeper. So uh, Colleen, uh, you mentioned what is the big story at Adobe, the transformation to a SaaS entity. Talk a little bit about um, how the, the development and organizational culture has had to change as part of that transition. Sure, well, um, I mentioned in the opening that um, at the start, our product development cycles were between 18 and 24 months long. And the call really was to move to a place where we could have production-ready software every 60 days. And so the implications uh, for my organization were to drive that reduction in cycle time as well. We've been able to move from quarter quarterly releases down to over 220 releases per year. And um, part of that has been through um, really focusing on how we shift from a waterfall methodology to Agile Scrum pretty aggressively. In addition to that, we've started to uh, implement continuous development in key uh, areas of our portfolio and have focused on uh, automation and monitoring to um, really enable that. What's interesting is that in addition to um, that, that reduction in cycle time, that we've also realized some pretty significant improvements in quality. And um, we've seen um, uh, a reduction of 50% of code, 50% uh, reduction in code-related bugs in production since we've driven down that cycle time. Great. Um, and so, Greg, uh, you have a company that deals with payments, a very thorny kind of situation. You also deal with international issues. Uh, talk a little bit about how, um, you know, basically how you guys are able to iterate so quickly and, and uh, among all these co complex pieces of landscape you're dealing with. Yeah, I think, I think that one of, the, one of the funny things is that as you grow a company, you get to pick very, very few things uh, to hold on to and sort of everything else falls out as a constrained optimization from there. And I think for us that very much we consider Stripe to be defined by the rate of our product improvement and that that is the thing that we focus on as from a technology standpoint, from sort of all of the way that we structure ourselves, that the thing we want to be able to do is sustain it. And at a tactical level, that, that implies a lot of things, uh, that we focus on end-to-end -end ownership of, of things by engineers, uh, that we, uh, we make sure that the, you think about things like test suites and, and, uh, and what your actual time between committing code and getting it out looks like, and uh, that if you make the right investments there, that you can make sure that uh, as you grow, you don't end up slowing people down. Uh, I think that 
there, you know, you kind of constantly have to go through uh, a number of shifts. I think everyone kind of goes th through the, uh, you start by building things when you're, when you're small and just getting started in a single place, single repository. You set a lot of patterns for how people are going to develop code, and then people just start doing that because you're focusing on building the product rather than trying to figure out sort of the, the underlying infrastructure. And then you find yourself a year later, two years later, in a world where suddenly all those things have slowed down, all those things have, have stopped scaling, and that I think the important thing is recognizing when that's about to start, and, uh, and then going and, and thinking through, okay, like, how should we be doing this? And so about a year and a half ago, uh, that, you know, it was kind of clear that we were going to need, not immediately, but on an on a, on a 18-month time horizon to uh, end up in a service-oriented architecture. I think that's basically the only way that people know how to scale systems. And uh, so we just started, let's start building new things outside of our, our main repository. And uh, at this point, we have a bunch of, of, of use cases and uh, that sort of that starts to drag along the rest of, of your development cycle with it. Uh, so I think it's a lot of it is about sort of knowing where things are going to break and trying to get in there a little bit in advance of it actually happening. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, Sam, I'll, I'll switch to you now. Um, so uh, a little bit like Moneyball, you guys are, are sort of disrupted the way people think about content for sports. And, uh, and talk a little bit about how the data, uh, website performance impacts how people view content. Certainly, I think from uh, you know, content consumption, um, you know, people are, are not very invested in content they're reading, so um, performance matters a lot, more so than ever on mobile devices where you have very variable connectivity. You know, the, the amount of time an article takes to load, the amount of time a video takes to load it is really critical in terms of retaining that audience and getting them to engage. So we spend a lot of time focused on how do we delay parts of the experience to load later? How do we preload parts of the experience for the next piece of content that you're going to consume so that it's already there in the browser by the time you click on the, the next button? And certainly on mobile, and as we looked up to native applications, that's really where we've, we've started to focus a lot more, and it becomes a lot more painful, particularly with advertising. And, and certainly as an advertising-driven model, there's a, there's a lot of bits of the page loading that we don't control. There's a lot of third-party JavaScript. There's a lot of third-party assets. So in, in a native context, we've started to invest a lot of time in um, building our own ad serving mechanisms that run on top of our, our standard ad server to make sure we have seamless consumer experiences. So when a native screen loads within the application and there's ads in there, the page doesn't shift around as those to try and load in, uh, that we're kind of preloading ahead of time so that you get a seamless experience where um, users will never notice that content loading in. Mm -hmm. So Colleen, uh, switching back to you again, um, you talked about the speed, uh, the, the, getting the iterations going faster. How are you fit, actually able to enable that in a company that, as you said, had you know, two-year cycles? What, what, what did you actually do to get people to move at this higher speed? Yeah, well, we've done a few things. And picking up on Greg's comments a little bit, um, one of the first, first things that happened to us was just the business had to move more quickly than it ever had before. And so it really caused us to accelerate our shift to a services-oriented architecture. And as you can imagine, in a company like Adobe, we had a lot of capabilities already in our existing system. So um, as an example, one of the enablers we did early on was um, we, we had an existing commerce engine. Um, we took that existing commerce engine, and we service-enabled it uh, and exposed a series of self-service APIs to the engineering teams. Um, and what that meant is um, they had services available to them for simple things like checkout, and we componentized it. So, so now today, whether you come to creativecloud.com or acrobat.com or adobe.com, if you go through a purchase experience, you're touching the very same set of core services. And since we made them self-service APIs, it no longer required an IT project to get commerce into your product. And that really has enabled us to move more quickly. That's one example. So Greg, Sam mentioned uh, the, the difficulty of dealing with outside organizations. I would think in the payment space, you particularly have this problem with various financial and other organizational you know, entities that you have to interface with. Talk a little bit about that issue. So you know, one of the things that, that I, I really love about Stripe is the fact that it's not, like in order to make Stripe work, it's not purely just some engineers in a room hacking things together, right? That, that fundamentally you need to have legal compliance, support, uh, and, and all these other functions that need to, to sort of operate to build this holistic experience. 
and uh, I think that we, we think really hard about exactly how outside organizations like the banks that we work with or the other partners that we have end up influencing the, the culture and sort of the rest of the way that we build things. I think it's really easy to end up in a world where you're kind of too afraid to, uh, to kind of push the envelope or to do things that people haven't done before uh, because uh, the, the, you're sort of, you know, you, you, you see all this downside, you see all the ways that things go wrong. And I think that, that probably the most important ethos that we have is focus on the upside opportunities, focus on the things that, if they worked, could be really, really awesome. And so you think about Stripe itself, right? When we were first going around trying to figure out how can you build a Stripe, most people were like, there's no way you can do that, right? There's no way that you could ever get instant activation of credit card processing on the internet. It's just not possible. And uh, that we focused on, this is the experience we want, and then went and figured out, okay, how do you actually make that plausible? How do you remove these, these risks and, and the downside, right, given that you're already going for, that, for, the, for the good result? And so I think that a lot of it is about sort of doing the right pathfinding, uh, and, and uh, that one thing that we do a lot of uh, is that, uh, for example, from, from a compliance standpoint, uh, so there's regulation around d uh, the data uh, security around credit cards. And so one thing that we do is we have a very small credit card vault, which literally all that it does is it just accepts a request containing a card number, tokenizes it, sends it to the rest of our infrastructure, which means that the vast majority of our infrastructure never sees credit cards. And so we, we do the same thing at a relationship level, that we try to think about, let's see how much we compartmentalize these things and mean that most people can focus on the core competency of, of our business rather than on, uh, on the relationships or, or the compliance. So kind of a question I'm going to throw to all of you and have you talk about it each individually. These systems now are generating vast amounts of data about you know, customer activity and all kinds of things. Um, I'm curious sort of what, where you are finding the most insights from that uh, information you're getting. Sam? Certainly, you know, there's a huge amount of data in Bleach Sports organization, and we, um, we certainly believe um, that humans armed with good data can make great decisions. Um, so you know, we collect a lot of data around you know, what all users are seeing on the website, what they're seeing on the front page, what they're clicking on, and you really use that to drive a lot of the editorial decisions. There's a lot of data that goes in there, but there's a lot of human decision making as well. Um, it's, it's very important to us to have a, a strong editorial voice and uh, not over-index on the data and have the front page get taken over by Justin Bieber and Kardashian content that right. people just want to click on. Um, it needs to have a bit of integrity to it. So it's, uh, it's important to, for us to find a balance there, but we collect as much data as possible and feed that into um, dashboards and, and analyses that uh, real humans can use to make decisions. Have you found anything really surprising from customer activity that you wouldn't have thought they would do or systems worked in different ways that you thought? Certainly, um, as, you know, in terms of um, data analysis, as we, as we look at um, the way that we produce content, um, you know, as we look at kind of how we've disrupted the space a little bit, there's things that have come out over time. So you, know, you get to the end of the NFL season, and all the other media producers start running playoff and Super Bowl content. And really, for a lot of um, sports fans, at the end of the NFL season, their, their team's done. Right. Um, and the next thing they actually care about is the NFL draft. So we actually start producing a huge amount of NFL draft content after the season finishes, because that's what the majority of fans actually care about, and they don't care about the playoffs because their team's out of the running. Greg, talk a little bit about your data experience. Yeah, so Stripe has, uh, in a lot of ways, like a snapshot of, of internet spending, right? That we, we have a ton of different uh, customer segments uh, that, that, uh, that use us, and, and we get to see kind of all the transactions that are going through. and. Uh, uh, so you, you kind of get to see the shape of what internet commerce looks like. Uh, and so one, one interesting thing is it turns out that no one buys anything on the internet on the weekends. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's definitely one of those things where you'd predict that either weekends would be super high because everyone's home and like buying things off of Amazon or super low because no one's at a computer. And well, it turns out it's the second one. Huh. Interesting. Colleen, what about you? I bet, I bet uh, Adobe learned, learned a few things you didn't know before. Yeah, well, our, our, our focus has really been on, um, you know, as you move into SaaS, the importance, obviously, of the customer experience goes way up. Uh, customers are deciding on a regular basis whether they're going to continue to use your service. And I always like to point out the number of clicks to cancel is usually less than the number of clicks to sign up. And so um, we've been focused on how we bring together uh, all of the information we have about our customers um, in addition to their usage of our products to make sure that we're maximizing that experience and combining that with the capabilities of the Adobe Marketing Cloud to conduct um, more consistent communications with our customers no matter how we're communicating with them, whether it's in the product or in email communication or whatever. So um, really making sure that it feels like no matter how we're touching you that we know who you are and what, you, what your engagement is with us. 
I mean, Adobe has some incredibly loyal customers that go back since the 80s, and um, you're, you're balancing getting the new ones with keeping the old ones happy and not angering those people. So I, I bet that you've had some issues there. Yeah, absolutely. And our, you know, and our customer base is is um, diversifying as well with the with the marketing cloud, and now with the flexibility that you have on the creative cloud, um, you have customers that can come and sign up month to month. So it's a very broadening user set that we need to be able to engage. So of course, data has been in the news because of all kinds of breaches and problems and leaks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, I'll throw this out to the group too. Have you learned anything from the recent disasters that have caused any changes in how you manage your data? Protect it. Yes. <laughs> I guess there's a, there's a lesson, never to phrase a yes or no question, with, especially in sports interviews. You know, they go to these great lengths to say <laughs> anything you'd like to share. Well, I, I would just say I, I think all of us are continuing to be much more aware and learning and, and taking um, our responsibility of our customer data very seriously. Greg, uh, you have financial data, or the, you, you could. Uh, anything you'd throw out there about uh, any lessons learned? I mean, I'd, I'd say that for sure uh, that a lot of what we focus on is, is securing like the, the credit cards that we have and all the other data that we have. And uh, I think segmentation is a really good way, kind of like the, the credit card vault that I described earlier. Yeah. And Sam, I, I'll leave it to you last thing. Anything you've learned about data protection or analysis? That... Sure. I mean, I think one of the things we focus on is um, making sure that we only keep the information that we absolutely need and not keeping any superfluous information and making sure that that's really locked down. Well, great. My, my sign here is flashing 000, which I think is a sign that says we have to end this uh, little session. But I want to have you extend your thanks to these lovely uh, people here. Thank you.